And he ended up bluffing both her and I out of a huge hand. Um, you know, I, I'm not making any excuses. I'm not saying there was any alcohol involved or anything like that. He beat me fair and square and, uh, and bluffed me and my mom, who was taking it very seriously. Hi, I'm Marco Messina, and welcome to More Ways to Make It with Skrill, the payments app for money movers and makers. One of the many benefits of a Skrill account is that you can make quick and easy online payments at leading casinos and poker rooms. And this guest is no stranger to some of the top poker rooms around. A very well-known name to the 200 million poker players around the world, he was the first person to win over $10 million in tor tournament poker, and the first person to win a massive, record-breaking $12 million in one tournament when he took down the World Series of Poker in 2006 as chip leader for seven days straight in what has been described as the most dominant poker performance of all time. And even those impressive figures are dwarfed by his remarkable philanthropy that has seen him raise a massive $600 million in good causes. If you think there's a better guest to prove that there are more ways to make it, I'll see you and raise you the former talent agent, now marketing specialist, board member, and advisor, poker legend, and philanthropist, Mr. Jamie Gold. Jamie, welcome to More Ways to Make It with Skrill. Wow, that is, uh, that is an intro. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm doing well. I, uh, I luckily made it through a couple of bouts with COVID, uh, stopped breathing a couple times in the hospital and didn't think I was going to make it. So I'm so much happier that I'm here talking to you today. This is my first anything interview, public, uh, anything in almost two years. Wow. I feel really blessed to, to be able to speak with you and to have you today. And I hope that, you know, uh, you know, we're wishing you obviously all the best of health. And uh, excited to have some fun today and talk to you because clearly from that intro, you're a very productive person outside of poker. I, I, I was still working while I was in the hospital. So you can call me productive or completely insane. Um, but I, I actually really love to work. And so I, I kind of thrive on it. And um, I get bored if I'm not working. And so... Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I really enjoy it. And uh, I'm a big fan of Skrill. It's one of the reasons why I've been able to continue playing online poker and gaming online, which has been vital during the pandemic, <laughs> I'm sure for a lot of people that, uh, you know, without Skrill and our access to online gaming and online poker, it would have been really difficult for me anyway, to get through this pandemic. And I can only imagine how difficult it was for so many people and all the people that we've lost. You know, what a, what a crazy, terrible time that we've been through. But a lot of us made it through. Um, I'm very thankful. And I'm really happy to be here talking to you instead of you maybe uh, having to hear that I passed. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm very happy. And, and I'm, I'm really impressed, by the way. Your, your work ethic is pretty incredible. So you said you've been working. So what have you been working on this week? Well, this week we are, uh, we're in the middle of launching uh, a transmedia company uh, that I'm really excited about. And I'm always advising you know, the, the groups of companies in our portfolio. I sit on the board of a few companies and you know, I, I like to be uh, as strategic as possible with the companies that I'm either invested in or on the board of. And uh, we were actually really fortunate that we could pivot through with most of the companies that I work with during the pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of the challenges that some of the, my friends that are involved in, in, uh, in companies that either went under or um, were really challenged and hurt by everything that's just been happening in the world, we were really fortunate that, uh, you know, maybe we made a few very smart and strategic moves, but I just, I'm just so thankful that, uh, that business is thriving and, um, and I'm here and able to, uh, to talk to you about it. So, um, you know, time is one of those things that, uh, that you can never get back. 
And so we all have to be really conscious about where we spend our time. And so I feel like I've, uh, in all my years of, uh, of work, I finally figured out a pretty good way of uh, biding my time and, um, and not giving it away uh, to places and people that, you know, I should not. Um, I've wasted a lot of time, I think, in my life. Um, where I could have been much more productive and, and helping the world and leaving a positive footprint. And so I'm trying to do as much as I can while, uh, while I'm feeling great again. That's an amazing message as well. What, what a start. What a start to this. The, the, uh, you know, the, the way to be thankful for everything that you have and, and to, to think about not being with those energy suckers. That, that's amazing. Have you found that, you, you know, you mentioned your businesses and, and you know, through COVID, <laughs> Have you found that it's made your businesses maybe more resilient now afterwards? I don't know if COVID has made the businesses more resilient, but I feel like it's certainly forced the the people involved in the businesses that I work with that uh, to either pivot and come up with new ways of working um, or they just won't be successful. I love not being tied to an office and uh, I do thrive on interpersonal and in-person communication, but I find that not having to spend the time to commute to an office, especially those hours that we would lose in traffic, I feel like we can be so much more productive. I think that it's, uh, it's a big change and a big shock, but I actually like the way that business is functioning now much more than it was before. If that well makes said. sense. No, well said. And that, that's really great perspective as well to have. Um, I want to get into your origin story a little bit. And of course, Jamie, you became famous in poker with that now legendary $12 million World Series of Poker win. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But before you became a poker icon, you started out as a talent agent. How did you get into that? And then how did you even you know, get your clients? Yeah, I, uh, so I, I went to school at SUNY Albany, which was close enough to my home in New Jersey. I grew up in Manhattan, but I went to high school in New Jersey. And, and the 10 years uh, that I spent there, uh, I was able to work as an intern. So I worked for free all during college. So for four years, over all my breaks and my summers, I was working for a pretty famous talent agent in Manhattan. And when I got out of school, before I was even legally able to drink in America, you know, I was 20 years old. Um, I had a job waiting for me. I was, I guess, the youngest, you know, agent in Hollywood, which was not something to be proud of necessarily. Uh, <laughs> it was very difficult. Who wants to be with an agent that has no experience? <laughs> so, so I was the least, let, let's not call it the youngest agent in Hollywood. Let's call it the least experienced agent in Hollywood. So I had to, uh, you know, I, I had to struggle a, a bit to find my clients, but I think I had a certain gift for discovering talent. So, um, you know, like someone introduced me to this kid named Jimmy Fallon and he ended up living on my couch for somewhere between six and 12 months. Oh my God. Uh, and, you know, we helped develop his career and, uh, you know, I met this guy named James Gandolfini who had just done a play um, off Broadway. And, uh, you know, we certainly, uh, you know, helped develop his career. And um, I started out, they would, they would actually only let me book soap operas in the beginning. Um, and so it's, um, it, it took me a while. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I was very fortunate. And, and I ended up representing, you know, over the years, about 50 pretty substantial writers and directors and actors and a few singers. And um, we built up a, a really uh, thriving company, you know, that, that was a management and production company. It's a manager and agent sometimes, you know, is a similar job. And um, so I was a manager for about 12 years. 
uh, and uh, setting up movies and TV shows. We had a few production deals at studios and, um, and I loved it, but I was getting burned out. And I, um, uh, I realized that, uh, that, you know, I could only do that for so long. You know, when you're, when you have one successful client, you're on call 24 hours a day. And if your name is on the door and you're running a company that has, let's say, 50 artists that are pretty successful, um, you have no life. And so <laughs> I, uh, I, I was getting burned out. I didn't take a vacation for 13 years. It, it sounds like you had your fair share of challenges, but you managed to make it a winning hand at the end of the day. So I admire you for always finding a solution. And that's, you know, really one thing that we want our listeners to take away from this podcast is that there's not one formula to success. Scribble wants to help people find their own way to make it just like you have. Uh, I want to chat about the good times a little bit right now. So you've pursued many different ways to make money, but there's one key occasion that led to that incredible moment at the World Series of Poker. And if it's not too personal, would you be able to tell us about it? I was at the point where I was getting burned out uh, in my career. And as I mentioned, I hadn't taken a vacation in 13 years. And my dad got sick and got uh, ALS. And watching someone go through Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, it's just horrible. You know, you become a prisoner in your own body. Uh, you basically go into a coma, but you're 100% lucid. So he was all there, but his body just basically quit on him and um and he couldn't breathe or or speak or it, it was really bad and so uh he and my mom convinced me that i needed to take a break in my life and that before he passed because you just know it's not going to last very long you know i think at that time the average was about a year and a half um he lasted a lot longer but in in general you know you're going to be losing your parent and uh, he convinced me uh, with my mom that I needed to take a break and do something selfish for, in my life. I had always thought that I was a pretty good poker player, um, but I realized very quickly that just because you can beat all your friends at chess does not make you a grandmaster. <laughs> and I started playing with the best players in the world because I was living in LA and, and, uh, and most of the best players in the world at that time um, were at least visiting LA at some point I should say the best players in America, let's say, mm -hmm. sorry, not in mm -hmm. the world, but in America. So it was Johnny Chan and Phil Ivey and Doyle Brunson and Barry Greenson and Chris Ferguson and, you know, and, and all of, you know, that group of players, they were not in Vegas as much as they were in LA. Um, most of the biggest tournaments at that time were in LA. And so I was getting wiped out by these guys and I was, you know, I was playing at a pretty high level and realizing that I could not compete with who I saw as a lot of the best players in the world. So I made it my mission to study the game. And uh, I made a, a, a deal with Johnny Chan and, um, and tried to make a deal with Chris Moneymaker uh, to be an agent for them. And even though I had, so I, I, I promised my parents that I would stop working for a year and that I would just focus on uh, poker and take one shot at the World Series of Poker. And as you know, you know, fast forward, I got very lucky and <laughs> things all went my way and uh, I ended up, you know, winning the whole thing. But that was my first time ever playing the World Series of Poker. And so I realized that I had to come up with that I was never going to be better than all these incredible players, um, at least not in, in that year. Uh, and so I studied, I read every book that I could. There was not a lot of information like there is now. There was basically nothing on the internet. There were a few books, uh, no videos. There was nothing. And so I basically just convinced Johnny Chan to allow me to make a few TV deals, book deals, movie deal, things like that uh, for him, even though I promised I wasn't going to work during that time. It was worth trading some services to allow me to... Uh, to kind of shadow him and just hang around and see and realize, oh, okay, these guys are playing on seven different levels. I was playing on maybe two or three levels and most average people are playing on one level. So yes, I was a little bit better than my friends. Um, and, you know, maybe I could kind of crush some home games, but <laughs> I was nowhere near these incredible 
professionals. And so I realized that by the time I was taking my first shot at the World Series of Poker, I had no chance unless I could come up with a method and a style that no one had ever seen before. Because we knew that 9,000 people were going to, you know, now it was going to be the largest event of all time. About 9,000 people were going to be playing. How was I going to get through that field with all the best players in the world would be there? I had to come up with a style that, that nobody had, um, had, had really prepared for. Jamie, amazing story. Absolutely amazing. I love that you found like a different path to success. It's very skrill. Uh, but I know you were teasing it a little bit. Isn't there an actual rule that's named after you? Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess that there is. It's, uh, you know, you don't, you don't like using your, your own name in the third person, but th there is something called the Jamie Gold rule where you cannot speak about the contents of your hand where it will induce or reduce action. And it right after I won, uh, most tournament directors around the world implemented that, thinking that I had an unfair advantage. Uh, but what they weren't realizing and what most players, if not all players, feel, that there should not be that rule in effect. The issue is about collusion. And it's you do you cannot do it when you're playing with more than one player. It should be no different than in a cash game. That if you're playing heads up, you should be able to say anything you want to them. You should be able to flip over your cards. You should be able to do whatever you want because it's not changing the action for anybody else. It's only affecting you. You're only giving away your own information. And so basically what it boiled down to was someone explained it, you know, in a very simple way to me that I was uh, maybe the first poker player that ever decided to just tell the truth <laughs> completely through the entire, you know, 15 hours a day for 10 days straight at that time. And poker players are used to people bluffing and trying to mislead them, right? And so I did, I, I guess in a way, I just did decide that I'm pretty much just going to tell the truth the whole time. And by doing that, no one will ever believe me. Now, this doesn't work a lot. It works one time. But I picked the right place at the right time to make it work, right? You, if you're going to pick one time to tell the truth in, through a poker game, you know, where you're supposed to be hiding your cards, I basically would just tell people almost like, you know, that little bit of that Jedi mind trick where... Um, you know, these are not the cards you're looking for. And so I would, I would just tell them straight, listen, I, I have the absolute nuts. You can't beat me. Lay down your hand and continue on in the tournament. If you don't want to go home, fold your hand. And they would just shove all in because they figured, how could I be telling the truth? And so, and it really worked really well. You know, if, if, I, if I only use that one kind of uh, strategy, I would have done really well. Now, of course, I incorporated a lot of other strategies, and um, and so that that gave me a, and and, of, and I absolutely ran very well. Of course, the cards have to have to go your way, uh, but I was fortunate that I never put myself in a position after day two or three. There was never a chance that I could be knocked out of the tournament. Meaning, like as long as you had more chips than everybody else at your table and everyone else in the in the tournament, no one hand could have ever knocked me out. And so if you can keep yourself in that position, which is a very tough thing to do, but uh, I was very fortunate that most of the time I had more chips than everyone else at my table combined, right? I, I, and when you have a dominant chip lead like that, you can also really take advantage of, of so many spots um, where people just don't want to be knocked out of the tournament. And so they'll make laydowns that, that they wouldn't have made usually because they know that, you know, that, that I'm willing to take larger chances, let's say. And, um, and so, yeah, there, there, there is a rule um, all around the world where it's basically stopping people from speaking during tournament play. Um, but there are also ways that you can certainly still interact. You just can't speak about the exact contents of your hand. But I believe that that will be overturned and I believe that it will be changed. And people like Daniel Negreanu and some other, you know, really high level players um, that people respect are fighting every year to try to change that back. 
for what it's worth, not that my opinion matters in this, but I, I really like the talking aspect to it. For me, it's entertaining as, a, as an outsider. <laughs> so just my opinion. Uh, Jamie, I want to take a break from the podcast for a second. Uh, in this segment that we like, like to call Off Limits, I'm going to ask you three quick fire questions, and I want you to lay all your cards on the table. All right? Sure. All right. So you mentioned the chip lead already, uh, that you can never be knocked out of the tournament. What was the tipping point for you early stage? Did you always think that, you know, maybe you would not make it through? Oh, I had my moments. Uh, okay. So day one, uh, things were not going well. And back then, now you start with 50,000 chips, or I don't know what it'll be this year, but in the last, you know, let's say, 10 years or so, it went from 30,000 to 50,000. Back then we were playing with 10,000 chips. So uh, I was I was down to as low as two to 3,000. And the blinds were high enough that that was really a one hand left mm-hmm. kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, one thing goes wrong and or, or it doesn't go my way and I'm out. And this was at the dinner break on day one, and I at the time I was playing there. It was I was playing for a uh, for a company called Bodog. I was sponsored uh, by them, uh, you know, before the beginning of the tournament. Johnny Chan had uh, had helped me set that up, um, and he convinced them that I was going to win the World Series of Poker, which was a very odd thing to say. Um, that believing somebody was actually going to, somebody they had never heard of before. Um, they had known that maybe I was an agent, but I think they really gave it to me because they thought that, you know, that I could bring celebrities, which, which theoretically I could, um, to the Bodog celebrity team. So I was part of the Bodog celebrity team, not a celebrity myself. Um, but on that team, um, one of the people at the time, he was uh, Superman on TV. His name is Dean Kane, And it was his 40th birthday. And he mentioned to me, he said, don't worry about it. If you get knocked out, he had a private jet waiting. We were going to go fly wherever, I think maybe, you know, somewhere out of the country or something. But he said, you're just going to come celebrate my 40th birthday. The jet's waiting. And I, so I remember texting him and saying that um, I have one hand left and I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> and so please hold me that seat and do not leave. I, you know, I, I want to take a trip because I'm going to be really kind of depressed about being knocked out when I thought I was going to come and, and win this whole thing. Um, and um, I'm going to be out at the dinner break. And I and so funny. So years later, uh, I was hosting a, uh, a charity tournament for Randy Couture. And uh, and I ran into Dean Kane. He said, you know, you and I um, hadn't spoken after that. He said and he said, so how do you end up doing? So, oh he said, God. I never heard from you on the dinner break of day one. How did it end up going? And I said, I, 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 don't, I think I did okay. So besides that kind of fun story um, where I thought I was going to be, I might be out at the dinner break on day one, uh, I, 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 you know, either got lucky or um, maybe played pretty well uh, and got back into a groove and became one of the top five chip leaders uh, on day one. And in the last hour of day one, I was seated, you, you know, they, you change tables sometimes, right? They break tables and condense as people get knocked out, you end up at, at different tables. And by the luck of the draw, the, uh, the top four, three or four, but, uh, I, let's say it was the top four chip leaders were all at the same table. I remember we were far in the back in the corner and you could just tell that, you you know, you don't necessarily want that to happen. So we all kind of give each other a look like, you know, hey, we each had, I think it was somewhere in the, you know, 100 to 150,000 range at that time, um, which was a big stack. You know, if you're starting with 10,000 on day one and we all give each other a look almost as if an understanding like, we either do not want to get involved with each other, right? Because we'd all like to be in the top five or 10 going into day two. You're not, you know, it's, it's never about being the chip leader. You just want to have more chips than everyone at your table so that you can never be knocked out. 
And so looking at each other, we were either giving each other that look, or I think one player was giving us that look like, wow, I want to knock, I want to knock you guys out so that I have all the chips. But I was just looking at it as I just wanted to survive and get to day two. I wasn't thinking the way that I ended up thinking on day three, four, five. And so one big hand came up and that was absolutely the turning point uh, of my entire tournament. Um, everything changed from that point and it never went back until even until the end. I, I you know, I, I never really had a moment where I, I could be knocked out um, except on day one. And so this hand came up. I remember I had pocket threes and I flopped. Uh, and by the way, usually I wouldn't even play that hand in the situation but the way that it went, someone limped, someone min raised, which is very odd. Uh, someone called, and then I'm maybe in, you know, in a blind or in a situation where uh, where I have pocket three. So it was a very easy call. Then someone re raises. Now I'm thinking, okay, so you know, this guy has aces, kings, queens, maybe ace king, something like that. Call, call, and now I'm kind of stuck in the hand where I feel like, all right, you know, if I hit a three, I can, and by the way, three of the players in this hand were chip leaders. So it's the players I did not want to get involved in, but you know, sometimes you just get caught up in a hand. And so now I call with the pocket threes and I flop a set. Well, you know, now I'm not going anywhere, um, but it is still a, somewhat of a potentially dangerous board. Because there was, uh, I believe it came, let's say it came, um, you know, it came ace, ace, queen, three, if, if I'm remembering it properly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the way the hand played out, you know, I, I won't go through the exact, uh, I won't bore you with all the details, but fast forward, I figured out that, um, that somebody had had kings. And somebody had had ace queen. And then, you know, I wasn't sure what the third hand was, but some kind of drawing hand where it ended up by the river. It was, there was a straight and a flush on the board. So my hand's basically dead. And a guy put me all in. And I was, you know, my instinct was, I'm just going to fold. I, I didn't, but I didn't have that many chips left now. So the, the pot was massive. So let's say that the, you know, that, that basically I was down to my last probably, I don't know, 10 or 20,000. So it's enough to go in, but I'm going into day two short. Mm -hmm. And it was, enough, it, it was enough to make me think, and the pot was massive. So it would have made me chip leader and, uh, and put me in a really serious position in the tournament. But you, you know, in general, you're never calling with a set on a straight and a flush board when someone puts you all in in the World Series of Poker at that moment, right? Maybe in a cash game you can, but, but so I, but I also felt like I was in this kind of zone where I could really read people very well. That might have been, you know, you know, one of the the skills that I had that was that was at a pretty professional level where I could really read people's hands, mm. and so I, um, I was convinced that. This guy did not have a straight or a flush, but he could certainly have had a higher set than me. And so I went in the tank and, you know, because it was such a big hand, people are, you know, and, and if you take enough time, people are kind of surrounding the table now and people are talking to each other. So now there's a crowd around knowing that this is the biggest hand by far of the tournament. And, you know, and of course the, you know, the, the, the reporters and, and, you know, so it kind of made it a very high pressure situation. And I, I'm staring the guy down and I'm believing that, that, uh, that he could either have a bigger set than I do or, um, or he's bluffing, but how would he be bluffing based on, on, on the way the hand played out? Was he bluffing from the beginning? So I, so I was just, I was staring him down and finally he got so upset uh, with me. And just and, and I've never seen someone get that upset when they had me, right? So to me, I, I, I just said, oh, my God, this guy must have ace queen because how upset could somebody be with me taking my time? It just didn't make any sense. And so I said, all right, I'm going to make a crazy call. And if I'm out, I'm out. But my instincts are telling me that, 
you know, that, that you have ace queen, boom, he turns over ace queen. Oh and that God. was really the, the turning point in the tournament. And only because he got so angry, if he would have just stayed calm, I would have given, who knows what would have happened. I may not have won the world series of poker. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. I'm happy. I'm happy you did. And I, I'm happy you're here sitting with me now. All right. Next question. What was your biggest ever bluff? It was when we were down to three players. So it was myself, Paul Wasica, and Michael Binger. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it became a pretty famous hand where I, I believe I had something like four or five of spades. Uh, and um, Paul had seven, eight of spades. And Michael Binger... I don't remember what he had, but he obviously had a, he had the best hand and it came out five, six, five, six of spades, you know, ace, five, six. And let's say Michael Binger had an ace. Right. And so and, and, and Paul Wasica had seven, eight of spades. So he had the higher end of the open ended straight flush draw. And I had the lower end of the open ended straight flush draw, something like that. And so I was drawing, you know, really thin to, to both of them. I just immediately shoved all in and, um, you know, you call it a semi bluff, but I certainly had, you know, almost a nut low, you know, I had nothing like a, a high card six. Um, and, um, but I had a draw and didn't realize that he, you know, when I, when I had talked about being in the zone, I did not have any idea what his cards were at that time, but I think I started playing a different strategy at the moment. I was constantly changing gears. So that nobody really knew what I was doing. You know, people would say, Oh, I could read you and I know what you were doing. There were times where I purposely, you know, may not even looked at my cards to make sure nobody could know what I was doing because I didn't know what my cards were. I was just playing the players. Can you share a story about a famous celebrity that beat you at poker? Uh sure. Yeah. <laughs> there have been plenty. Uh, but uh I was asked to host the Virgin flight of Virgin America Airlines, if you remember that airline that uh, Sir Richard Branson, uh, mm -hmm. you know, created or yes. owned. And he had never played a hand of poker in his life, but he had asked, uh, and maybe, you know, some people at his company were excited about having me put together uh, a weekend for him. And so I flew with him and, and we brought some other celebrities um, and it was so much fun. I ended up teaching him, uh, you know, a little crash course on how to play poker. As I said, he never played a hand of poker in his life. Uh, and we hosted this event at the Wynn uh, with, you know, celebrities and, uh, and for charity. And uh, my mom was also there. And uh, so, you know, she's, you know, been so kind and supportive and she'll come to a, a lot of my events. And he ended up bluffing both her and I out of a huge hand, um, you know, I'm not making any excuses. I'm not saying there was any alcohol involved or anything like that. He beat me fair and square and, uh, and bluffed me and my mom who was taking it very seriously. You know, she, she takes these charity tournaments pretty seriously. She's very competitive, um, even more than I am. Um, but I usually, you know, I'm not trying to win a charity tournament, but I was, I was absolutely trying to trying to win that hand. And, um, and he bluffed me straight up. Wow. Wow. That, that's a great story. Very insightful stuff, Jamie. I appreciate that. Now to go back on record a little bit in this next bit, we're going to talk about money and success. There are many ways to manage your money with Skrill from sending money internationally with no fees to buying cryptocurrencies instantly. What do you use your Skrill account for? Oh, I mean, it's fantastic for me because I can pay online without sharing personal information. You know, we, uh, we're, we're so at the mercy now of, uh, of companies and, uh, you know, things online that are um, corrupting our information. And so I don't, I feel just so much more secure using it uh, that way. Um, and being able to move money in and out of my gaming account, you know, in seconds when I'm playing poker online is, uh, is a big benefit. The last thing you want is to, uh, you know, is to, uh, bust online. And then it takes, uh, you know, a long time, if ever 
to uh, to be able to refill your account. So um, yeah, it's, it just makes my life so much easier. Awesome, we'd love to and hear safer. that. <laughs> now, I'd like to talk about uh, your mentality and how you handle success and the money come that comes with it. First, were there things that you learned from the talent management that we spoke about earlier that you used in poker? Certainly learning how to read a room um, and figuring out a path to success, no matter what hand you're dealt, uh, is a great skill. Um, you know, managing your success, uh, because very often when when you have a certain level of success, your ego can get in the way. And uh, I've certainly learned to, you know, keep that in check and um, make sure that it's it's always about giving rather than looking for what you can get from people. So, you know, in business uh, and in poker, it's about risk versus reward and being prepared and setting yourself up to be successful. You know, those are really the the most important lessons that I've learned um, that relate to both business and poker. Wow. It seems like uh, everything you touch turns into gold. Excuse the pun. But what are some other key ingredients uh, to your success that you've used in multiple areas? Yeah, I, I found that uh, a lot of my success comes from being of service to others. Uh, you know, instead of looking for what I can get from people, what I can actually give them and what value I can provide to, to people. And, uh, you know, it's incredible how successful, you know, your life can be uh, when you're just thinking about how you can help other people. Um, I've also surrounded myself with the best people that inspire me um, and that are, uh, you know, much smarter than I am. And so, um, you know, one thing that, that I, I, I always like to, uh, to share when, when anybody asks me for advice is that uh, time is such a valuable resource and you know you have to be really careful with your time um, and how much of it you give away. Um, also always trying to give up the credit and, um, and help other people you know build their brand as opposed to you know I chose purposely not to build up my own social media accounts. Um, one because I'm you know, a, a pretty private person in general. And two, um, I'm just much more comfortable. You know, I purposely did not become an artist. I became someone who represents artists, right? And so that's really where I wanted to be. I love building up other people's channels and helping them market and promote their brands as opposed to trying to build my own. You know, I, I don't really focus on my own social media almost ever. Um, um, but I do bring a kind of a collective knowledge and experience to the relationships and the projects that, that we're working on. Um, and the thousands and thousands of people that have attended our events, you know, a mix of famous and successful and generous and kind and, and, you know, uh, just brilliant people that I've been lucky enough to host at these hundreds of events. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a really great journey. And, and I love to share, you know, any knowledge and experience that I can with people whenever I can. For any of our listeners that, that want to learn how to make it, I think they could take from you uh, your great positive attitude, <laughs> which is amazing. And in fact, I think you've been working with actor director John Krasinski on a feel good show recently, if I'm right. Yeah, it's called Some Good News. And uh, during the pandemic, you know, even while I was in the hospital, <sighs> Uh, and I was having a hard time breathing and couldn't speak very well. Uh, I felt like I needed to do something and I certainly couldn't put on a live charity event. So I was looking for something online and, uh, I was connected through a friend, uh, Lars, um, to John Krasinski and this show called some good news that he created. And I was fortunate that I could uh, bring in this team um, that I work with at Fifth Element, a uh, public benefits corporation, that we could provide some really high level sponsorship like Pepsi and Starbucks and, and work on these initiatives that, you know, not only were they bringing in um, you know, the most famous people in the world like Sam Jackson and Oprah and Steven Spielberg and the cast of Hamilton and the cast of The Office and and uh, Brad Pitt and Robert De Niro and 
it was just incredible what they were able to pull off. Um, and I was just really proud that I could support them in, in any way. Um, we all did this for free. You know, no one was being paid, no matter what anybody thought. Um, we, were, uh, we all did it for free. And just to try to raise as much money as an awareness as we could for COVID relief, which I, even just one of the campaigns, I believe the AT&T campaign uh, gave away, you know, 65 to 85 million dollars to for COVID relief. Um, and that was just one campaign. Them saying no is is a testament to you as a person and the friendship that they have with you, by the way. So it, it's amazing. And, and I know you've created you know plenty of opportunities to, to do things, you know, your own way. On the flip side, what challenges also has your success brought to you? Oh, there's certainly, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had my fair share of, uh, of challenges. I mean, one is just not spreading myself too thin. Um, in one way, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact that I have this unlimited opportunity all the time to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be involved in some incredible businesses and projects and opportunities, but I really, you know, only have a limited amount of time. And so I have to say no a lot more than I can say yes to things. But um, certainly, um, you know, I, I try to help as many people as I can and as often as I can. You know, if, if there's ever a way that I can donate 50% of my time to charity, uh, I do. Um, but um, right now, that's not the case. You know, I did that hundred percent of my time during, uh, during COVID was pretty much, um, at some point, you know, donated to trying to give back and, and help the world. Now from the financial side, uh, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? I would say that, uh, focusing on your passion is a big thing and, um, investing in yourself first mm -hmm. is a great lesson. Um, giving back, um, and being generous, uh, with your time and with your money and your spirit, um, being patient and prepared, you know, a lot of which we're most successful in, it comes from preparation. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, you were really lucky in that spot. Well, you know, you, sometimes you really prepare to get into a position where opportunity will come to you, right? And um, I think working smart as opposed to working long is a great lesson. You know, it's not always about how much time you put into something, but how smart uh, you're working on something. Um, so, you know, being of service and providing value to people makes your life really much more satisfying. You know, I, I love giving gifts much more than I like receiving gifts. It's nice, but I really love, you know, finding a, a great gifts for people, you know, in whatever way that is. And, and uh, as I mentioned before, just surrounding yourself with the best people. You know, I, I'm so fortunate to work with, um, you know, some incredible people that uh, are also my friends and some of them for a long time. You know, some of the people that I went to college with that I've known for, you know, 30, 40 years are the people that I'm actually working with now, which is just the dream of all dreams in life um, to be able to work with your friends and, and family. Um, it's amazing. So, um, yeah, if you surround yourself with the best people you know, and, and try to never be the smartest person in the room is a, is a great lesson. Similar theme uh, on our podcast as well. So great advice. And I'm sure our listeners are going to appreciate that. Now, Jamie, we have this section that we call your big money move. Uh, you became world famous overnight when you won the World Series of Poker with that incredible $12 million win. That was clearly your big money move. But do you have any other times in your career where maybe you went all in and did it pay off? You know, it's just my personality uh, and the way that I'm wired that I'm always all in um, or I just don't engage. You know, sometimes people, companies will come to me and ask me to, you know, do some marketing or uh, some strategic advisory for them. Um, you know, they're having a little challenge and I rarely just do what I'm asked. Um, I always try to over deliver and, um, you know, I end up giving, you know, if you ask me for level one, I'm always giving you level 10. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting way to live. Um, but sometimes, you know, I give a lot more than I'm necessarily 
being compensated for, let's say. Um, but that's okay. And, you know, I, I feel good about myself uh, and making sure that I'm never shortchanging anyone. So um, I don't really have, you know, many regrets uh, in, in that area, certainly in business, because uh, I'm always giving it everything that I have. Um, so if for any reason something does not work out, um, I, you know, I, I can't imagine that it was for a lack of effort uh, on my part. Very nice. And now when it comes to specifically looking after your money, do you have investments other than your businesses, of course, like do you trade, have property, buy crypto, uh, and do you gamble or play it safe from the tables? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I dabble. Um, in, in several different areas. Um, I'm, a, I'm a never ending student of life. Uh, I am, I am a sponge for information. Um, I'm always, you know, either reading or listening or watching, or I'm just constantly taking in as much information as I can. Um, very often it's to serve the, the companies that I'm involved in and the businesses that I want to grow. Uh, but also personally, I'm just, you know, I, I love, you know, being a student. Mm. And so um, I'm, I'm a big believer in the underlying tech of blockchain and the revolution of crypto. And I am really just learning and getting my way, you know, getting kind of a, an understanding. Um, even though I've been in and around it since the beginning, I've been a big supporter. You know, I was, I was going to some of these crypto conferences, probably what, you know, six, eight years ago wow. <laughs> when they first started. Uh, I was just fascinated with it all. And so um, I, don't, I don't hold much of it. Uh, you know, I don't have any big crypto holdings, so I didn't become a crypto billionaire or anything like that in the boom. Um, but I, what I love is the, is the educational part of it. And so I'm very involved in helping people learn because I believe that it's the, it's the equivalent of the beginning of the internet. Mm -hmm that blockchain is going to be as ingrained in our lives as the internet was. So when the internet first started, you remember that this is only 20 years ago that people were saying, ah, maybe it's a fad. And, you know, I'm not sure about, you know, certain things that there is no life for most of us now without the internet. Right. And I don't believe that there's going to be much life uh, for most of us in the next five years without blockchain. Now, it doesn't mean that any one specific coin is going to be in your life, but blockchain, I, be, I believe, will be the underlying tech that we are building on. Um, and certainly it's better you know, for, uh, for systems than most other things. I do believe that everyone should have at least some small percentage of their portfolio in crypto. Uh, but you were also asking about gambling. Um, in general, in life, I'm not a gambler. I know that sounds crazy, but um, I'm very strategic and really thoughtful about what I do. You know, I, I might overanalyze things sometimes, but I'm, uh, I'm not a gambler outside of the casino. I love it. and I love playing in casinos. Um, you, know, I, I've, you know, I'm into some sports betting and um, I love it. Uh, I love everything that, that a casino is all about, as long as it's not hurting anyone. You know, if, if anyone has a problem with it, then and certainly, you know, they should not be there. Um, but other than uh, other than that, I, I'm, you know, I'm so excited about uh, spending time in uh, casinos and in gaming. Um, but uh, but no, I, I'm not I'm not the biggest gambler in, in life and in business. Um, I take risks, but they're calculated risks. Good lesson. And for all our listeners out there, you might not be quite ready to win the World Series of Poker yet, but you can make quick, secure, and easy <laughs> online payments to leading poker sites with Skrill. If you want to find out more, all you have to do is head on over to Skrill.com where you can open a free account. And now, Jamie, it's time for me to cash in all my chips I'm definitely ahead in the knowledge stake, having learned about your rise to the top of the poker scene, your mentality of going all in, and your amazing philanthropy. So I'd like to say a massive thank you on behalf of myself and the entire Skrill team for joining us today. And also, I'd like to thank our listeners 
for joining us at the table as well. I'm sure, like me, you've been inspired by Jamie, who epitomizes our belief that there are definitely more ways to make it.